All right. So as we've been uh, studying in our Sabbath school lesson about making friends for God, a lot of times I talk with people that are afraid to share something with somebody for fear that it won't be accepted, that they'll reject it. Uh, sometimes people are tempted to what we call water down the message uh, to make it easier for people to accept. Although I believe that any truth that is shared from the light of the cross is easy to accept because it's in the light of God's love. And so uh, I just want to encourage us here to feel comfortable sharing the entire truth with our brothers and sisters, with our friends that we want to be friends with God. <clears throat> Sorry, and here in Mark chapter 10, uh, beginning with verse 17, Jesus meets a man. This man actually comes to Jesus. A lot of times we go to the people, but uh, here the man comes to, uh, to Jesus, and in verse 17, it says, Now as he, Jesus, was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and ask him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And in uh, the book of Matthew, it says that the man said, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? And so a lot of times, you know, people look at that question and they think, oh, wow, that's a, a really profound question. You know, asking what good thing to do to have eternal life. However, we're going to see that this question is actually a very shallow, self-serving question. A, a noble question, a profound question would be, Jesus, how can I express my love for you? Jesus, how can I please you more? How can I share my appreciation for your great love? Those would be profound questions. But this man is asking what is actually a very shallow, self-serving question. Oh, what good thing do I have to do to make sure I get to live forever? All right. Uh, so Jesus answers. In verse 18, Jesus says to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. Now, a lot of people uh, think that Jesus was just being real modest here. You know, why are you calling me good? Only God is good. Jesus was always modest and humble. But what he's doing right here is ask, looking for conviction. All right? He's saying only God is good. You just called me good. Do you realize then that I'm God? What he's looking for is conviction in the man. And then he goes on in uh, verse 19, Jesus says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not commit murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Now, again, as I said earlier, we're going to see where this man is not looking for a relationship. But yet Jesus just took him to the commandments, which are all relational. You know, uh, do not uh, commit adultery. Do not murder. I think those are pretty important for good relationships, right? Uh, do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Don't defraud. Honor your father and mother. These are all dealing with relationships. All of the commandments are relational. And the commandments are there to help us have good, healthy relationships. Now, it's interesting because here we are in the New Testament. A man is asked how to have eternal life. And Jesus took him straight to the Ten Commandments, which is ironic because so many people uh, want to say today that in the New Testament, the Ten Commandments were done away with. 
All right, what we're going to see here is the commandments were not done away with. As a matter of fact, let's take a look at what David thought about the commandments. Let's go first to Psalms 19, verse 7. Psalm 19 is about the law of God. And in Psalm 19, verse 7, David says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. So what we see here are two very important things. First of all, the law is a part of the conversion process. And what we also see is David is saying that the law of the Lord is perfect. Right. All right. That, that's very important because I have met people today in, in different denominations that tell me that that law was just nothing but bondage. It was in our way and Jesus died to get rid of that law because it was causing us nothing but trouble. Man, that's terrible. Well, that's not, uh, that's not how David felt about the law. David says the law of the Lord is perfect in, in the conversion process. So uh, let's take a look at some other things that David said about the law in uh, Psalm 119, verse 97. Psalm 119. Verse 97, Psalms 119 is one of the, well, it is the longest chapter in the Bible. And in this longest chapter of the Bible, David is talking about how much he loves God's law. And he just said in Psalm 119 that the law of the Lord is perfect. So if David were to find out that God's law was done away with, he would be devastated because David, under inspiration, realizes the law of the Lord is perfect in the conversion process. And, and now Psalms 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, is all about that law and how much David loves it. So in verse 97 of Psalm 119, David says, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Now, imagine if a prophet of God is saying, I love this law. It's perfect. I love it. And then God turns around and says, no, it's actually terrible. I'm going to get rid of it. That doesn't make any sense, does it? No. Not at all. So let's uh, take a look. In uh, Psalms 119, verse 136. Verse 136. David says, Rivers of water run down my, uh, run from my eyes, because men do not keep your law. This is how much David was in love with the law. He says, you know, it, it causes him to cry when he sees people not keeping it. And friends, it should cause us to do the same. In Ezekiel chapter 9, 19. it says to put a mark upon the people who sigh and cry for all the abominations done in Israel. That they would be spared from the destruction. And friends, it, it breaks my heart when I see standards being lowered and where sin is just, uh, you know, being tolerated. It should be breaking our hearts. It should be causing us to cry. And, and it, it bothers me when I see people lowering their standards and patting themselves on the back at the same time. We shouldn't be patting ourselves on the back for lowering our standards. It should be breaking our hearts. It should be causing us to cry. That's what happened with David. And in, in Ezekiel 9, 
That is what happens to the people who have the seal of God. They're crying. They're sighing and crying for all of the abominations, all of the sins that are taking place in God's church. And so here we see David loves the law, says it's perfect. He cries because people don't keep it. And then let's take a look here now in verse 126. Psalms 119, verse 126, David says, It is time for you to act, O Lord, for they have regarded your law as void. All right, so this is telling us that when people are saying that it's the law is void, the law is done away with, then is the time for God to act. Okay, do something about this. So if, if David were to hear this popular idea now that the law is void, the law is done away with, David would be brokenhearted. Okay, he, he was telling God it's time to act because they're making void your law. That tells me God's law is not supposed to be void. It's supposed to still be in effect. All right. Um, and, and as far as that idea that, uh, that the law was in the way, the law was something bad, you know, brought us into bondage. It tells us in Hebrews 8, verse 10, that God did not find fault with the law. He found fault with them. He found fault with the Hebrews, the Israelites. Because when the law was given, instead of trusting God's power, they said, oh, everything that you said, we'll do. We'll take care of it. We'll do it. And they weren't claiming God's promises. They were making their own. And the fault was not with the law. The fault, it says in Hebrews 10, Hebrews 8, verse 10, the problem was with them. For, for finding fault with them. The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. Through the whole conversion process, the law of the Lord is perfect. And it's not what brings us into bondage. Uh, let's uh, go back to Exodus, where God gave the law. And we're going to take a look at Exodus uh, 19, verse 5. I and it says, now God is talking to Israel, and he says, now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. All right, at first glance, that might sound kind of legalistic, obey, listen, keep my covenant, but... Uh, Let's, let's back up and take a closer look at this. The word obey in the Hebrew is the word shama, S-H-A-W-M-A-H, shama. It means listen, be attentive, pay attention. So when he says, obey my voice, well, you don't obey a voice. What he's saying is, listen to my voice, be attentive, pay attention to my voice and what I'm about to say. And then he says, if you keep my covenant, well, a covenant is a one-way promise. So how are we gonna keep Jesus's promise? The word keep in the Hebrew is the word shamar, S-H-A-W-M-A-R. It means to cherish. It means to tenderly regard and to treasure, okay? So when God tells Israel and tells us, keep my covenant, what he's saying is treasure my one-way promises. That word keep, which is uh, shamar, which means to cherish, 
to treasure is the same word in Genesis 2.15, where Adam is told to keep the garden. Okay? It, Adam wasn't supposed to obey the garden. It meant that he was to cherish it, to tenderly regard it, to treasure it, to preserve it, to love it. And so what God is telling us, if you will love my promises, if you will cherish them, I'll make you a special people. And then we go to uh, Exodus 20, where God gets ready to give the Ten Commandments. And in verse 2 of Exodus 20, it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now he's getting ready to give us this law, and the purpose of the law is to keep us out of bondage. The law doesn't lead to bondage. The law saves us from bondage. And what God is saying here is, I delivered you from bondage. I delivered you from slavery in Egypt. You did not deliver yourselves. I did it for you. And so he's going on and he's actually promising them. You will have, you shall have no other gods before you. What he's doing is he's promising them. I will save you. I will take care of you. You're not going to need any other gods. I will save you. <laughs> Every command is a promise, and it's a relational promise that is to keep us out of bondage. All right, let's go to Nehemiah uh, 13, and we'll start with verse 15. And we'll see uh, again how uh, the law keeps us out of bondage. Nehemiah 13, starting with verse 15. And Nehemiah is speaking. And he says, in those days, I saw people in Judah treading the wine press on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and loading donkeys with wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them about the day on which they were selling provisions. Men of Tyre dwelt there also, who brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Judah and Jerusalem. Okay, so what were they doing? They were buying and selling on the Sabbath. And that's one of the reasons why uh, Sabbath keepers do not buy and sell. This is why one of the reasons why a lot of Sabbath keepers do not go out to eat on Sabbath, because we don't want to buy and sell. And as the Sabbath commandment says as well, we don't want to cause people to be serving us either. And, and so uh, in verse 16, it says, well, uh, I just read 16. We'll go to 17. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, now I want to stop right here because something we see something very important right here. Nehemiah sees something going on in the church that is wrong. Okay? It needs to be corrected. But he doesn't call the people doing it hypocrites. He doesn't call them phony Christians. He calls them nobles. And I think that's important for us to keep in mind. That just because something is wrong in the church doesn't mean that the people are being hypocritical or that they're phony. Noble people can make mistakes. And Nehemiah realizes this. What they're doing is wrong. It needs to be dealt with. <laughs> but he's still calling them noble people. All right. I would like to see us do that in our nation right now. 
address things that are wrong with our country without calling each other names. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. So that we could be more noble. And uh, so he says here in verse 17, I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, what evil thing is this that you do by which you profane the Sabbath day? Verse 18, did not your fathers do thus? And did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Yet you've added wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. All right, what Nehemiah is saying is it's because of all this that we fell into slavery in Babylon. This is why we're, we were in bondage to Babylon for 70 years, was because we weren't keeping God's law. We weren't keeping the Sabbath holy. Friends, the law does not lead us into bondage. The law saves us from bondage. The law <laughs> saves us to live at liberty, free from sin. All right? So, uh, let's take a look now at Romans 3.28. Romans chapter 3, verse 28. And uh, Paul says something here that's very important, but it's not new. A lot of people think it's new, but it's not. In verse 28... Paul says, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. So what Paul is saying here is the law isn't going to save us. Paul isn't saying anything new. In the Old Testament, nobody was saved by keeping the law. In the Old Testament, everybody was saved by grace. That's why we had the sacrificial lamb pointing to Jesus, the lamb of God, who would be sacrificed for us and save us by his grace. So in the New Testament, when we, we read Paul saying that no flesh will be justified by keeping the law and, and that we're not made right by keeping the law, he's not saying anything new. In the Old Testament, we had the law but we were saved by grace. In the New Testament, we're still saved by grace, but we still have the law to point out what is right and what is wrong. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, people will confuse these things that Paul says sometimes, and, and Peter said, you know, that they can be confusing, but give Paul credit because he then, realizing somebody might get confused, spells it out loud and clear in verse 31. In verse 31, Paul says, do we then make void the law through faith? Okay, remember David was telling God, work, you know, do something because they're trying to make your law void. And here Paul is saying, do we then make void the law of God through faith? Certainly not. Again, David, under inspiration, was so jealous of the law, he would be devastated, bewildered, if God were to turn around and get rid of it. As a matter of fact, God couldn't get rid of it. When Jesus was in Gethsemane, and he was crying out to his father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Possibly one of the things the father could have done was said, well, I, I tell you what, we'll just get rid of that law that everybody broke. And now you don't have to die for them. We'll just get rid of that law. But you know what? The father, as much as it broke his heart to see his son crying and struggling the way he was, the father could not get rid of the law. To get rid of the law would be to get rid of his character. The law is others first. 
The first four commandments tell us how to put God first. The next six commandments tell us how to put our neighbor and our family first. That's the essence of the law, love, and love is others first. Satan defined sin when he wanted to be number one instead of everybody else. That's sin, putting yourself first. Jesus on the cross was willing to be obliterated from the universe and to go into total oblivion if that's what it took to save us. And that is putting others first. That is the character of God, and that is the character of the law. Others first. For God to get rid of the law, he would have had to destroy his own character. And it was because of that that Jesus had to drink that cup and Jesus had to die was because there was no way around the law. It's good. It's perfect. And, and so Paul here is making it clear in, Clay, in case there was any confusion Paul makes it clear, do we then make void the law through faith? <clears throat> Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So in the New Testament, instead of finding the law has been made void, Paul is making sure that we understand the law is being established. And we see that also in uh, Romans, when we go to Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. Revelation 13, starting with verse 8. It says, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. And again, if we love somebody, we put them first. That's what the commandments are about. Others first. All right, verse 9. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. All right, and I've talked to people that have said, oh, well, in the New Testament, the law was done away with. We just have to love each other now. And I've told them, well, if I love you, I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to lie about you. I'm not going to steal from you. So if I love you, I'm going to be keeping the Ten Commandments. You see, that's what the commandments are, is love. Love fulfills the commandments. Therefore, love establishes the commandment. Paul makes it very clear that the law has not been made void. The law is all about others first. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to go back to Mark chapter 10 and we're going to pick up the story. Mark chapter 10 and we'll uh, pick up with uh, verse 20. So Jesus has just told him that uh, referencing the commandments here. And in verse 20, he answers, the, the rich young man answers Jesus and says to him, Teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Okay, this is very important. Because we love the people that we are trying to make friends with for God, right? 
We love them. Jesus looks at this man. Jesus loves this man. All right? But he doesn't love the man. The loving the man doesn't cause him to say, well, you know what? I think, I think you've done pretty good. You know, you, you have eternal life. I love you. Uh, you. You've said you've kept the commandments. We'll just let it go with that. No, Jesus can't do that. He tells him, one thing you lack, all right? Uh, as Seventh-day Adventists, we, we struggle with this sometimes because there are so many unique Bible teachings that we have. Our teachings aren't unique to the Bible. They're unique to a lot of the Christian world today. And they're not accepted by a lot of the Christian world today. And, and, and I've seen many times when people are working with somebody, bringing them into the church, they're like, well, this one doctrine, we shouldn't let that one doctrine get in the way. We shouldn't let that one standard get in the way. You know, they're good people. They've done good. You know, let's go ahead and give them our blessing. Jesus couldn't do that. Jesus realized there was still one thing that he lacked. And so he tells him, which, by the way, let, let me back up and expound on what I was talking about there. Even in our, in our church sometimes, where when we have uh, like the uh, sanctuary message, our, our teaching on the Sabbath, and things like that, I think sometimes we're afraid to teach it because it's so different than what everybody's already heard. And we're afraid it's not going to be accepted. But friends, if we don't teach these unique doctrines, then there's no reason for us to exist as a church. You know, and I've heard people say, well, the other churches aren't teaching it. Why are we? Well, we're teaching it because they're not. If, there were, if we didn't have these unique doctrines like the sanctuary, and I say the Sabbath, but there are other churches that keep the Sabbath. But if, if we're not going to teach the things that make us different, then there's no reason for us to exist as a church. We might as well just go join the other churches. We exist because we teach things in the Bible that other churches are not teaching. And those things should not be overlooked. If they should be overlooked, then there's no reason for us to exist as a denomination. Jesus is saying, one thing you lack. In verse 21, go your way, sell whatever you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come take up the cross and follow me. Take up the cross. Jesus is calling for a total surrender. Surrender everything you have. Pick up your cross. Come die with me. Total surrender. And, and I said it before that one of the things that really concerns me about the Christian world today in all of Christianity isn't that most of the world has forgotten that there's a Sabbath. What concerns me is most of the Christian world today has forgotten there's a cross. Most of the Christian world today has forgotten that we are to be crucified to self, total self-surrender, instead of just choosing those doctrines that are convenient for us and then saying, oh, well, that's close enough. Jesus want, says one thing you lack, and that's total 100% surrender of everything you have. Pick up your cross, follow me, I'm going to go die, and I need you to come die with me. I need you to follow me. I need you to have a relationship with me. But again, remember when the rich young ruler came to Jesus, he wasn't looking for a relationship. He wanted to know what good thing must I do to have eternal life. 
he was just looking for something legalistic to do to earn his way to heaven. And Jesus says, no, it doesn't work that way. I need a relationship with you. I need you to give up everything and come follow me. Well, we read in verse 22, it says, but he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Now keep in mind, it told us there in uh, verse 21 that Jesus looking at him loved him. Now he sees the man walking away because he can't make a complete surrender even after he had already done so much. What we don't see Jesus doing is chasing after the man, saying, okay, okay, wait up, wait up. I tell you what, just sell some of the things you have. Don't You don't have to sell everything. Just sell some of the things that you have and then come follow me. That'll be good enough. But Jesus couldn't do that. Jesus, as much as he loved the man, had to present the entire truth to him. And just as much as we love our friends and want them to make friends with God, we too have to share the entire truth about Jesus. Jesus had to watch him walk away. He couldn't cut a deal for him. He couldn't lessen the standard. It takes nothing less then complete surrender. And again, it tells us in Romans 8.32 that, that the Father gave us his Son. And won't he also freely give us everything else? How would that be fair for God to give everything he has and for us not to give everything we have? How would that be fair? And if the cross has converted us, if the cross has transformed our lives, then we're going to give everything because Jesus gave everything. Yeah. You know, the, the message of the cross, Jesus willing to die forever in order to save us, turned the early church and the world upside down. It totally changed everything. And thousands were being converted. Friends, today, that same message can turn our world upside down. We don't need fancy programs. We don't need really cool far out worship services. We don't need gimmicks. We need to presenting be presenting to the world the cross so that they can be saved. And when we appreciate the cross, we will give Jesus everything because on the cross, Jesus gave us everything. Exactly. And see, that's the thing. We love Jesus because he first loved us. Uh -huh. We're not just looking for a way to get to heaven. This man was looking for a way to get to heaven. And he was saying, now, what have I got to do to be saved? How do I know that I'm going to be preserved? And yet Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood before Nebuchadnezzar and said, God's able to save us from this fire, but let it be known. Even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down to this image. Why? Because we love God. Because he first loved us. It's not about getting to heaven. It's not about getting out of hell. It's we love him because he first loved us, end of question. And friends, I believe the world is starving for this message of the cross. I was thinking yesterday, when I was thinking about and was reading about, you know, how the Democrats and Republicans are going at each other right now. And, and there's such bitterness and such hatred in this world right now. And I, I'm thinking to myself, how is it that a world that is so hungry for love 
is still choosing to be so bitter and hateful. Right. Friends, we have to let the cross take that bitterness and hatred away so that we can experience love. And, and so Jesus has to watch this man walk away. And then in verse 23, it says, Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Amen. Friends, it's impossible for us on our own to keep the commandments. But Jesus, when he told us in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. In the very next verse, he said, I will send you a helper. Jesus knows that on our own, it's impossible. But he knows with the help of God, with the help of the Holy Spirit, all things are possible. And we can reflect the love of God with the Holy Spirit's help. We can reflect the love of God to a world that right now is so hungry and so desperate for love. The cross can take away the bitterness and the hatred. And again, it's beyond me right now why a world that is so sick of hate and bitterness and is desperate for love is still choosing to be hateful and bitter. That's true. Friends, the cross can change our lives. The cross can still change this world. We can still make friends for Jesus as we present to them the law of love in all of its completeness. We don't have to leave anything out. Jesus said, you still lack one thing. Jesus didn't hold anything back from us on the cross. He gave it all. And when we experience the cross, we too will give all and make that total surrender. Amen.